All right, guys. Uh, thanks for viewing my video. This is going to be chapter two. So let's get started. Chapter one, as we talked about, was kind of getting ourselves in the right mindset to do geography. We kind of learned about some of the ways that geographers think. We learned about some of the ways that geographers relate to the earth. Chapter two is much more focused on the planet, not the way that people kind of project the earth and figure out where they are, but we're talking about the planet itself. So as you probably know, planet earth is one of many things in our solar system. There are all sorts of objects in it. There's planets, asteroids, and comets. We all know this kind of stuff. So let's get to know the earth a little bit better. We obviously, there's water, there's land, there's air all around it. So 70% of the Earth's surface is water. That's what's called the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere includes oceans, lakes, and streams. 30% of the Earth's surface is land. The land of the Earth is called the lithosphere. And then the atmosphere that surrounds the Earth is the layer of gases. These extend above the planet's surface. The atmosphere is mostly made up of nitrogen and oxygen. Now let's focus on the lithosphere, the land forms. The land is made up of all sorts of different natural features, mountains, plains, stuff like that. The largest land form on the planet is a continent, and there are seven of them, North, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia. Australia and Antarctica. A continent is made up of the land above the planet and also the um, area a little bit under the ocean. That's called the continental shelf. The continental shelf is the part of the continent that extends underwater for a little bit before it meets the continental slope and then drops to the ocean floor. So that's section one, all about getting to know this strange planet. Now, section two is all about how this planet changes. The Earth is not just sitting here. It's changing all the time. Right now, can you see, can you feel it? It's changing, it changed. It just changed, it's a little bit different. The Earth is always, always, always changing. So first, let's think about the Earth's structure. The Earth is made of three different layers. There's the core, there's the mantle, and then there's the crust. The very center of the Earth is called the core, and it's made up of super, super hot metal under enormous pressure. The, literally, the entire weight of the Earth is pushing down on this core, making it super, super hot. Now the kind of the middle layer is called the mantle. This is a thick layer of hot, dense rock. On top of the mantle is the outer layer. The outer layer is called the crust, which is kind of this rocky um, eggshell almost uh, of the earth. Now the crust is made up of many plates, which are parts of the crust that kind of literally float they're floating on the mantle. They're not connected. There's lots of different parts that they're floating around. And these plates are constantly moving at about one inch per year. So that means one inch from now, I will be sitting about here. I, the, the continent will have moved that far. We don't realize it. It's moving so, so slowly that we don't perceive as ourselves as kind of floating around the Earth on these giant islands called plates. We don't notice it. Now, the moving plates are part of a theory. This theory says that at one point in time, all of the continents were one giant thing, and they broke apart. And now, they're in the process of moving around again. This theory, that the continents were once joined and then slowly drifted apart, is called continental drift. The places where the plates collide or pull apart 
create many of the natural features on the earth like mountains or trenches. Stuff that we experience every day is caused by this moving around of plates. Now there are lots of different ways that the earth changes. It doesn't stay the same. That's a very important point to keep in mind is that we are here just for a moment in terms of earth time. Just a few decades and that's it. So we don't perceive a lot of these changes and we have to figure out how the earth works and changes based on what we experience. So the inside of the earth is causing some changes. For example, all of these plates that we've been talking about are running into each other all the time or moving around like bumper cars almost. When the plates meet, they do all sorts of interesting things. For example, subduction is the process where one plate dives beneath another plate. So this means we've got two continental plates, they're coming, they collide with each other, and one plate is going to slide beneath the other plate. That's called subduction. This is how mountains like the Andes were, farm, were formed in South America. Another process is accretion. This is where pieces of the Earth's crust come together slowly. There are a bunch of, of different plates, and as they come together slowly, the sea plate slides under the continental plate. This kind of levels off underwater mountains and piles of debris in certain places, and it actually makes the continent get bigger. That's one of the ways that geographers think that North America got larger is that this piling up of debris caused land to, to actually get bigger. And another way is when these planets actually pull apart. They pull apart really, really slowly, one inch per year. And that causes a tiny little gap between the two plates, which causes magma to bubble up from the earth and form new land. So you're probably wondering, does that mean that the earth is actually getting bigger? As we're sitting here, the Earth is getting bigger. Maybe one day we can be as big as Jupiter or the Sun. Not quite. What happens is, so as more land is created and the plates pull apart, remember subduction we talked about where one goes underneath the other one? Well, as that plate goes down, it actually melts in the mantle, which causes the Earth to get smaller here while it's getting bigger here, and the two balance out. So all these moving plates cause all sorts of weird things to happen. They cause folds and faults. For example, moving plates can actually squeeze the Earth's surface, causing folds in the layers of rock. Plates grind and slide past each other all the time, creating what are called faults. These are cracks in the Earth. Eventually, these two um, plates might get snagged on each other in these places called faults, and that causes a lot of pressure to store up. The earthquake is caused when all of that pressure suddenly releases and the two plates move really quick. On the earth we notice a shaking of the planet, but the earthquake has really been a process that has been happening for a long time and it just suddenly released and moved. Also where plates come together, there are volcanoes all the time. One plate might dive past each other, and that causes a bunch of pressure to build up. And also, different parts of the planet are thin, which causes um, the heat of the Earth to suddenly spew out through thin points in the crust. So all of these are happening as a result of internal change. Things on the inside of the Earth are being expressed and causing new, new land, new um, expressions of that land to appear all over the earth. That takes millions and millions of years for this to occur. So we don't really notice it. But still, the earth is changing. Now, change can also happen on the outside of the earth. For example, weathering. So weathering actually breaks down rocks by splitting them up or by altering the chemical makeup of those rocks. So for example, you have a, a solid rock right here. In the winter time, a little bit of water gets into a crack. 
that water freezes and expands a little bit. That forces the crack a little bit open. Then the next winter, a little more water gets in there. It freezes and expands. It makes the crack a little bit bigger. Then the next winter, same thing, a little bit bigger. Next winter, same thing. Next winter, same thing. Next time, and eventually, this one rock has been broken up into lots of smaller ones. It's the same thing that happens to the road. That's why when uh, springtime comes along, suddenly there are all these construction crews having to fix all the holes that have happened in the road as the water froze and contracted, froze and forced the cracks bigger. Also, did you know that water is actually a chemical? And when water hits particular types of rock, it causes the rock to actually change. It becomes a new rock because the chemical water kind of makes a new rock, which can cause it to break up or to look different. That's weathering. Both of those examples are weathering. Wind erosion kind of wears away the Earth's surface. It strips away dust, sand, and soil, and it moves it to another place. So stuff over here gets blown away all the way uh, somewhere else. It becomes new landforms over time. Also, there's a thing called glacial erosion. Glacial erosion is caused by huge sheets of ice called glaciers. These glaciers come down, or sometimes they move around, and as they're doing so, they're pushing, they're smashing, and they're moving anything that gets in their path. Now, you don't have to worry about a glacier sneaking in in the dead of night and destroying your house. Glaciers move about the same speed as continents, something like one inch per year. They're really, really slow. So we don't have to worry about those things coming, but when they do, they cause all sorts of different changes. They, and when they leave again, they leave behind lakes or moraines. A moraine is a large pile of rock and debris caused by glaciers. The final way that Earth can kind of change from the outside is through water erosion. And that occurs when water kind of flows over the land, wearing away soil and rock over time. You might have noticed that, say, like there's some dirt in your backyard. If you have a heavy rainstorm, maybe uh, the water has flowed over that dirt and suddenly there's like a little canyon kind of thing. The same idea happened in Arizona and formed the Grand Canyon, of course, is the most famous example of water erosion that I think has ever existed. So that's section two. Now finally, we're going to talk about section three, which is all about the Earth's water. Now I think you guys have all learned uh, about what the water cycle is. The water cycle, of course, of course, occurs when water evaporates off the surface of the Earth, condenses in the atmosphere, and then falls back to Earth as precipitation. Now there's all types of water on the planet. So let's talk about the two kind of divisions in water. There's salt water and then there's fresh water. Okay, so let's talk bodies of salt water. Oceans are, of course, the most obvious. Also, there are seas, gulfs, and bays that are bodies of salt water. Um, these bodies are slightly smaller than an ocean and are often partially enclosed by land. 97% of Earth's water is salt water, which means that fresh water is kind of an exception to the rule. Only about 3% of the Earth's water is fresh water. Most of the Earth's fresh water is actually frozen in ice and glaciers, which doesn't help people drink it because it's frozen. Lakes, streams, and rivers are freshwater sources uh, on the surface of the Earth. Other freshwater sources include groundwater, which lies beneath the Earth's surface and kind of seeps down from lakes or rivers or rain. That's the kind of water that we tap into when we have some sort of well. There's also a fourth source, which is called an aquifer, and these are really slow flows of water into underground porous rocks. Both groundwater and aquifers are really important for helping people find water to drink. We're going to talk more about how challenging it is for a lot of people to find water in class, so I'm excited about that.